event for all those that cannot attend in virtually in person. Um, welcome everyone to this Angel Investing for Beginners session. I'm thrilled to have you here. Thank you for joining on this lovely Tuesday morning. We have three great speakers and panelists here for you today. We will try and keep this very engaging of a conversation and engage all of you into it as much as we can, roping you in um, to ask your questions or add comments. This room is pretty diverse across the board as I'm seeing names, some are new to me um, and others are very familiar. I encourage all of you to chat um, about yourself, whether you're an entrepreneur or an investor or just an interested party in the chat and then a link to your business, to your LinkedIn, however you would want people to connect with you after the fact. Um, I'd like to recognize that I am uh, zooming in from Anchorage, uh, the lands of the Dena'ina people um, who have stewarded these lands for, gosh, thousands of years um, and thanking them for that stewardship past, present, and future. I'm Melanie Lucas-Conwell. I manage the 49th State Angel Fund, which is a venture capital fund and public-private partnership program hosted within the municipality of Anchorage. So zooming in from City Hall itself, we have a program where we match private capital investments into startups uh, across Alaska to double their money if we can. There are a couple of different check size ranges. Um, so we've been working for, gosh, the last nine years at this fund to disperse funds into promising Alaska startups and helping grow the ecosystem with events such as Alaska Startup Week, which I hope you all know about at this point, since it seems like we've plastered about it uh, everywhere we could. Alaska Startup Week has over 60 events happening this week that we are so excited about, um, ranging from educational sessions to open houses featuring entrepreneurs um, and discussions between founders. So I hope that <clears throat> you have all added some of those events to your schedules and calendars to make sure that you make the most of all these free events happening. And with that, I'll let our panelists introduce themselves. Um, Addy, do you want to kick us off? Sure can. Hi, I'm Addy Akufa Apple, uh, one of the heads of venture programming over at WeFunder. Uh, WeFunder is a regulation crowdfunding platform that has helped raise over $362 million to date for founders uh, from both their community as well as accredited investors. Uh, most people also know me as AAA, so we can go with that as well. Um, I'm currently calling or zooming in from the Austin, Texas area on the central lands of the Tonku Monk. Um, and thank you all. Super sad to be here. Thank you, Addy. Anna, how about you? Good morning, everyone. My name is Anna. I am a business owner here in Alaska. Uh, we started a fossil fuel donuts company a few years ago. We do keto, vegan, paleo donuts. Uh, and in starting this business, I also had the opportunity to start investing in Alaska companies. And that's how I got uh, involved with the Alaska Angel Conference as a co-fund manager last year. And now working to get our next edition for 2022. Uh, set up. Uh, super happy to be here and to help uh, however I can. Thank you, Anna. Ricky. Hello, everyone. My name is Ricky Tejapaibal. I'm the managing partner of Tech Wildcatters. We're a venture capital fund and startup accelerator program. We were founded in 2009. We are headquartered in Dallas, Texas, but I'm here this week in Anchorage, in the land of uh, Daniana, like the acknowledge the founders of this land as well, but I'll be here all week. So if anyone after this call wants to grab coffee, meet in person, then uh, happy to, to set up some time. But uh, yeah, I'd like, like to share our knowledge of what we work with the startups to help startups say what channels of funding are available for the startups and what investors are looking for as you go through each stage of the cycle of, of your startups. 
Thank you, Ricky. I'm so thrilled to have all three of these panelists. Um, as you have questions, please raise your Zoom hand and we will gladly help uh, unmute you and ask those questions live. Ask them in the chat. Let's make this an engaging session as much as possible. That's why we didn't make it a Zoom webinar, but rather a Zoom meeting so that we could see all of you and make this much more personal since uh, investments tend to be that way. So to kick us off, um, could each of you tell us a little bit more about the stage of companies that you invest in and um, the types of investors that you uh, try to attract within your funds? Um, and for Ricky specifically, perhaps you could give us a little bit of insights as to what a VC fund, what your investors are into the fund itself. Uh, yes. So whoever wants to unmute first, please go ahead. Yes, I can go for it since I already hot button hit the unmute button. So we're a venture capital fund. And the way we do is we have investors that invest in our fund. And then we as fund managers then invest in startups. So we're similar to your shoes that we have to pitch to our investors that why is investing in a startup something that they should be doing? And why are we the experts, the qualified people to help you find those investments? So investors in, in startups could be anywhere from in angel investors and angels could do direct investments or they could invest in the fund, could be family offices, could be corporates that want exposure to startups, could be pension funds, could be fund of funds, sovereign funds. So, if they look at it from a portfolio standpoint, that venture capital is an asset class that has a very long horizon because when you invest in a, in a startup company from investment to exit, it could be anywhere from five years or even longer cycle. But then the returns that they're expecting is also higher and it's illiquid, meaning that if they invest a day, they can't just decide a month later, I want to sell my investment. So it comes with this uh, illiquidity that they're in it for the long haul. But we're trying to educate them that, hey, if you invest in just one company, it may sound like it's risky, but if you invest in a portfolio of companies, then the risk level actually goes down. And a lot of times it's, it's not as correlated with how the market moves because the stock market goes up and down every day, every week with some external news. But when you're investing in startups, you get a find a good company with, with excellent founders and you're in it for long haul. So you're less uh, prone to those uh, short-term market movements. Thank you, Ricky. Sure, Abby. I thought we were working, <laughs> we're working backwards. All right. So uh, on for WeFunder, we kind of work with founders looking to raise a community round. So usually it's individuals who are either looking to start the pre-seed round uh, friends and family, basically, if you're able to raise up, if you're looking at raising a portion of it and already have soft commitments for friends and family, most likely coming onto our platform, a 2x to 3x investment volume going towards your company, right? So it's usually for individuals who've already spoken with angels, already spoken with your family members looking to raise uh, a significant small, like, or significant or small round. And then from there coming onto our platform, allowing our user base of around 1.3 billion users to also co-invest alongside them. We work with in individuals from uh, funds like 49SAF all the way to also micro VCs and angel syndicates who are just looking to supp supplement their current rounds that they're investing in for companies. And um, one of the biggest benefits to this is that these individuals already have the knowledge associated with investing and the track record uh, so that individuals who are actually unaccredited investors can uh, kind of invest alongside them knowing that they have a track record of success or successful uh, exits for the companies that they've invested. Hi, everybody. Uh, so for the Andrew conference, uh, we invest in Alaska companies um, in the previous issues, uh, in the previous editions, we invested in Alaska companies. Um, some of them had already revenue, so we can do like a revenue redemption model or notes. And some of them were in the customer uh, developing the product. They had an MVP and doing the customer discovery. So we go for the very beginning of the company to having some revenue and some history, but not um, a high uh, income yet that VCs would be uh, interested. Thank you. So as you all can see, these three investors are uh, very much across the spectrum um, in terms of at what point in time 
uh, do they play in with a startup's growth um, and the stages that it's going through and when you need that money? Um, following up with that, how do you each recruit startups and let them know that you are open and ready for business and writing checks? I guess I'll go first. So multiple channels. So let's say this week we're out here in Alaska. We want to talk to Alaskan entrepreneurs because uh, there's a lot of startups out there. There's a lot of VC funds out there, but we really believe in, in that it's a match of uh, relationships that we invest in you because we, we trust you or, or you take money from us as investor because you trust us. It's not just that every dollar is the same, but how do we not only provide capital, but provide value? And it has to be a founder that we're comfortable working with in the longer term. So this is an example, but we, we also have applications on our website. We get a lot of inbound traffic as well that'll come in and they'll apply to our accelerator program. And we also go to whether it be tech events, conferences. We were just out in Web Summit in Lisbon last week. So we, we got to source founders from, from around the globe. So we're headquartered in, in Texas, but, but only about a quarter of our companies are, are, are from that region. We get companies from East Coast, West Coast, uh, international and, and uh, hopefully find some good Alaskan companies here as well. I, I second Ricky there. It's a, it's a relationship um, match. Uh, so there's a lot of coffee drinking. You gotta talk to a lot of people and uh, develop your network. And that relationship will last a long time. So uh, it's, again, being out there face-to-face -face with people and asking, who should I meet and uh, who else do I need to talk to? Uh, and uh, showing what you can bring to the table and what you're looking for. Um, again, I think it's multiple different avenues like Ricky and Anna was just talking about. Uh, most of the time for WeFunder, it's mostly inbound coming in. So inbound usually takes up around 40% of our actual, like the companies that are coming through our platform. The other 60% uh, comes in from different events we're kind of co-hosting all the way to different accelerator programs we are partnered up with to working with portfolio managers of different firms who are looking to like to basically uh, allow their, if it's a CPG product, allow their consumers to invest alongside them. Um, and then from their angels and syndicates as well as micro VCs. And currently we're also running a few different programs when it comes to like venture partner programs uh, with different institutes uh, as well as in, uh, based upon the geography as well. So we're looking to expand our venture programming arm, uh, not only in the US, but actually in Latin America, uh, uh, Latin America, Europe and Africa the next couple of months as well. So a lot of deal flow, hopefully. <laughs> And the 49th State Angel Fund is very happy to be one of those venture partners for WeFunder. And um, as Addy mentioned earlier, 49 SAF has invested through WeFunder into uh, local companies, one of them being BabyVend, uh, led by Jasmine Smith. So we've been thrilled to have that partnership. Um, and one of the things that always strikes me as it comes to deal flow is that you always think you know who you want to be targeting and you have that list of emails, but you keep going back to all of them. And probably some of you are on my target list already when I send out information, but it's really about capturing the ones that you don't know how to reach or who, who it is it that is not in your network, but should be a company that you're investing in. Um, and that's really hard to do. So a lot of engagement and entrepreneurs are busy founding their startup and getting it off the ground and not necessarily spraying and praying all the investors to see who's going to respond and write a check to them too. So it's a very fine balance between um, all of that. Um, and we have a great question already from Oki. Thank you for asking it. Um, how are investors navigate, navigating evaluation of projects or products that will ultimately be owned by a community rather than traditional capital shareholder models. Um, and thinking about, okay, so as investors, or at least, okay, you're welcome to unmute and give more clarification, um, but also 
I think I would be interested in hearing from the three of you around, well, how do, how do VCs or angel investments play um, if it isn't a traditional capital model? Oki, did you have more details to give? Yeah, so I guess the, the reason this question is coming is um, in, the, in the space that I hang out, there's already the ability to kind of collect a form of capital from users. But what we're realizing is we're needing to almost create tools immediately that aren't necessarily part of like a final end product, but they build onto a product roadmap. And those key elements could use funding. Um, it's, it's where like, you know, you need to find talent real quick to build something or have certain specialties on the team. And maybe like the timeline is in three years, the product will be done, but along the way we have to have these key pieces made. For now, what, what we're doing is basically trying to build tools that integrate into existing platforms like Discord, or other tools out there that have an API, but we're integrating some of the functionality of Web3, um, like JSON web tokens. So, um, and the IPFS network stuff for NFTs. But that's that's why I'm wondering, like, do, do any funders just look at specifically like investing in little areas for a project? Do they have to see a whole roadmap? Um, I'll pause there, thank you. Sure. Okay. So uh, in terms of WeFunder, and especially when it's uh, looking to raise from your community, right? Um, that one is specifically targeting as your company as a whole, right? So it's mostly individuals investing in the product in itself and saying, hey, look, in the next couple of years, is either through a safe note or convertible note. Mostly in this case for you, I would definitely go with a safe note. Uh, it's saying in a, in a few years, we see this project coming to life in this aspect. This is the possible valuation it may be coming in at that point in time. And so unlocking your community and saying, hey, look, you guys can invest in this right now when it's still on the ground. And this is the possibly where we're gonna be going is fantastic because we don't need the full, the full map here. Most individuals who are investing at this point in time are looking at seeing what, what kind of product can you build out right now and how can you get there, but we don't see the full product, product roadmap, roadmap at this point in time, sorry. I need some water. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's pretty much it at this point in time. It's mostly wanting to see exactly what is your plan right now to get to the certain stage you're looking at. And then from there, of course, on a different round or a secondary round, that's where we want to see exactly your, your five-year plan at the end of the day. When you say owned by a community, community is a collective of individuals, correct? So it can it still be owned by shareholders, but it could be hundreds of shareholders, thousands of shareholders. And then there are certain, uh, uh, so, so startups typically try to stay with just accredited investors or a small investor pool, because once you go above number of investors, then you're subject to more of a public offering SEC uh, regulation. But uh, at some point, once you do cross the threshold, then, then yes, the company can, can get, get funded by the community. And investors in the early stage will also acknowledge that at some point, the company will go through that, that public offering. But at the end of the day, the, the we're building a great product, but investors are also looking for, for returns. So it's a product that will make the company sustainable, profitable, and also create good things out, out there for the economy, for the community. And with that, then, then it'll also attract investment dollars from the community. And it could be dollars that they're writing checks to the company, or, or it could be as customers, as participants, or as growing the community. So I think it go, grows hand in hand. It also increases the value of the company when there is such a strong user base that's also invested in the company, maybe not directly like as a shareholder, but has incentives aligned to see the company succeed. I'm piggybacking off what Ricky was saying um, in terms of how things are done, especially with uh, crowdfunding platforms currently is that um, we utilize an SPV associated with anyone's investment. So every single person that's possibly investing into your community or investing you around currently will be placed into one line on the cap table, very similar to what Angel Syndicate utilized. And basically you just have to elect one lead investor to oversee the entire round. So the best part about this is if there's ever an opportunity, let's say for you guys to acquire a different company, you only need to reach out to that one lead investor versus trying to unlock the entire community to sign off on something, right? So that's fantastic moving forward. And I just wanted to chime in there. That's really cool on that last one. Thank you. Gosh, those are all better answers than I could have given. Thank you guys. <laughs> <laughs> and hopefully that brings um, a little bit more clarity there, Oki. Um, and taking even a step back, generally speaking to the three of you, um, what do you look for uh, in a startup and in an investment 
and what does that diligence process look like? Um, partly from an investor standpoint in the room, some of us are investors here um, to share those nuggets of wisdom, but then for the startups here, what should they make sure that they're including in their investment proposals, uh, in their pitches, um, and maybe even what does not work and people should not spend any time on. For me, one of the, the first things I look at a company is the team. Um, the individuals working, how their relationship with more than one owner, their relationship and how I can uh, relate to them. Uh, if there is, um, if we speak the same language, uh, if uh, the values are aligned uh, and beyond the team is the, the, for me, is the customer discovered. Have they doing their, mar their market research? Um, have they found out who their, who their target is? Uh, as the as company develops, you have a target uh, market more uh, narrow and narrow. So you can tell the age of the customer, the gender, uh, where they live and all of that. In the beginning, that's very hard to do because it's an expensive process, but having the basis over for that is, is for me, the, the first and most important. Yes. For me, I think it's about the founders. It's about building that relationship, that, that trust and seeing your progress. Sometimes uh, uh, it, it takes updating investors, build a relationship six months to a year, even before you're ready to raise the funding round saying, this is what we're planning to do. And then show that you're, you're actually making progress towards that, whether you hit all the milestones that you said you were going to, or even not, but what did you do throughout the process? What was your learning experience? And, and uh, how is it that you're showing your resiliency and, and keeping investors in the loop on that? And that, that, that that's something that's uh, very important. Definitely. And, uh... For us, it's a little bit different, right? So it's usually individuals who are targeting um, their network uh, very early on. And so for us, it's mostly for an outside investor that's looking to, to jump in uh, to a round that's already open, it would be the team, how it, uh, looking at their backgrounds and seeing how they're able to adapt, right? Having those conversations if possible and seeing, okay, um, what was your previous, uh, your previous role in a different organization? Are you a subject matter expert in this particular organization that or your particular industry you're jumping into? Um, and then lastly, of course, uh, specifically for WeFunder, it's unlocking your network. Do you have a strong enough network that's looking to back you either from testimonials or either to investing directly into your product? That's what we're usually looking for, especially when they're launching on our platform, because it's all a network and marketing uh, game at the end of the day. It's making sure that you're able to, one, sell your story in the right way to actually convince a lot of our investors to say, yes, we want to take a chance on you. And that's the biggest thing, just making sure that you're able to convince them and they're able to actually look at your background and say, yeah, you are the person to make this happen. And that's one of our, I'd say one of the biggest uh, things we look for. And looking at the flip side, what what startups have you seen do something that you thought might actually hurt their pitch and their investment capabilities? I feel like we all have a story of, oh gosh, this person did this one thing and they really shouldn't have. What has that looked like without naming any names? I think it's about being truthful to your investors, being truthful to your audience that this is where you're at now. This is what why we see the opportunity, but investors, because investors sees hundreds or thousands of pitches all the time. And if you're making stuff up, you're claiming things that that you can't really back it up, then they'll see through it. And then once you lose credibility on one thing, then you, your the entire the rest of your pitch then pretty much goes down a drain. Just then, then what else can I trust? So I think that that's a, that's something that that's important. Show that, that that you're genuine and and you're differentiating, and you're not just trying to to copy what another company is doing. Or, or something, but but show that that why are you unique? Why are you the best in the world in, in what you do? And then we don't have the entire full resource for everything, but but what areas that we need help with? And it, you can if you can identify those things, it goes a long way. That that you self evaluate that what can I keep doing to continue to improve? I would have to agree there. Um, I would definitely say is, I think something we've seen in the past is about traction associated with some companies. 
um, and then kind of falsifying that traction. And usually when we are able to look at their current revenue, um, have that have their uh, financials done in gap format, that's where we start seeing a little bit of issues associated with the numbers that they've, they've plugged in. Uh, there was one, one company that uh, during the first initial phases of, of their raise, uh, utilized financials done by them internally. Uh, we did. We looked over them. They seemed to be decent. However, uh, a couple of weeks later, when we were, we took, uh, we sent it over to uh, one of our one of our, our CPAs, uh, they ended up looking into it and be like, "No, this this is absolutely falsified. <laughs> um, we definitely have to go ahead and cancel this campaign right away." And luckily enough, we hadn't dispersed any funds during that time because the form C had been filed. And so it was, it was a great catch by us. Uh, but looking at those kind of things is, is something very, something that we funder and other Reg CF platforms are getting better at in terms of making sure that we keep everyone accountable uh, when it comes to finding these actions. I think for us was some uh, situation similar to what Adi just said, uh, mixing funds from personal and business in the beginning. Uh, so the credit card bills are all combined, uh, the, the accounts are combined, so you can't tell what's business, what's home mortgage, and it was really hard to tell where the business war, uh, was financially, because it was person and business. I know uh, when you're starting your business, you're doing everything, but your personal life finances and your business finances have to be uh, separated. Thank you all. Um, and let's see, we have a question from Brad Pizzamenti. If Brad, do you wanna unmute and ask it around traction and capital? Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm trying to get clear about, um, you know, precisely what the relationship you all see is um, between investment in the company and uh, furthering where that company's at, obviously, when we're talking about new revenue startups. Um, I, I've always been told that money is more of an accelerant than a resource itself. Um, throwing money at a company won't get you traction. It will just speed up the processes that that, that team is executing on. And I guess I'm curious, what other, what other resources you look for to make sure that uh, that money is accelerating the right things? Thanks. So I think it's about proving each part of your business cycle, each part of your business model. And each investor, they'll have the different investment thesis invested when at different stages. So let's say a series A investor want to see certain things and then they're looking to scale at, at, at let's say you prove it in one market or right now let's go to after 10 other markets. If it's a seed investor, then all right, you've proved some level that or you have an MVP, you're still building your product, but but you've you've also proven that that at least it de-risks a lot of the, the things from, from early on. So it really depends on traction you're looking for. If, if it's an accelerator, like, like so for us, we have the accelerator, we also have the, the later stage. But let's say for accelerator, we, we, we wouldn't say that any business model, oh, you're too early, come back with us with some numbers. But it's about how do we help you get to those revenue numbers that, that a seed investor would then find attractive. And the rule of thumb would be, let's say a million dollars in any recurring revenue ARR, or even you're not a million yet, but you have the strong pipeline that you're growing at that this much month over month that you will get to that million dollars within a year. And, and that's something that, that you can start teeing up and our seed investors will see you as, are right, you're having meaningful revenue numbers with, with, with traction. And so revenue paying customers, that's the best traction, but in some business models, then it may not be paying customers, but if you have a hundred thousand users, you have a million users, then it, they may not pay directly, but maybe it's a two-sided marketplace that another customer on, on the B2B side might be paying because they want access to your users. So by showing some of these meaningful numbers, I think that that goes a long way. It's interesting. I think I was thinking of the question kind of the other way around. In other words, uh, the notion of VC as partner to, to help create the traction rather than using traction as a qualifier for their involvement to begin with. Yes. Yeah, so traction from a customer standpoint is one thing, but the, the VC may be looking at, and, and that's if it's a VC that's an earlier stage that, that we're willing to come in at pre-revenue or pre certain revenue numbers, but 
we still want to see from a product standpoint or from, from a, a business competitive advantage standpoint that what are you building and how we can help you build that. But you have to have something that, that you've shown progress. So let's say if you're very early at napping an idea, then, then for the accelerator portion, yes, uh, you may be a good fit for that. It will still take you longer though to get to that, that seed round or, or to show outside investors that, that want to see more traction. But there, there will be investors or, or angels that are willing to work with you even early on because they believe in your vision. They believe in, in your background, what you differentiate, what's your competitive value, even you haven't actually built it yet, but they can only help you so much. They can only invest a small amount of capital. They can only contribute to so much. And then we have to show that traction in order to attract some of the larger later stage investors. And to add on to that, um, expanding the question a little bit more, investors are there to see these companies grow early stage angel investors family and friends are all there to support you and it's not just about the money of course money is very important as we all know um, but it does those connections that mentorship and oftentimes if if you don't have both a technical and a business background in your company advisors can help plug in those gaps uh, in knowledge and help direct you um, at the later stages of the company, it can be very much about connecting you with potential customers and other business partners that would help you grow or even recruit and hire folks for your company. All that, well, to some extent, the investors want their return. So whatever will make their investment more valuable and increase their returns is really at the end of it, um, but really to see you be successful. Um, we've also gotten some questions. Oh, go ahead, Addy. Oh, sure. <laughs> uh, so for us, it's mostly um, some of the companies that usually come on, especially if it's a napkin-based idea. We've had a few different napkin ideas where it's a digital wallet coming on. And the, uh, the founder knew, the founder only knows, knows about crypto. However, they weren't a technical founder, but they were able to raise 750000 due to the fact that, one, they had a large network because, again, they were a YouTube star talking about crypto. They were able to bring bring their YouTube following over to the investment side and actually invest into the product. And then from there, they ended up hiring a team as they kept on developing, as they were continuously raising, they were uh, they kept on recruiting team members. And at that point in time, uh, providing updates to their investors that actually helped them raise more funding. Um, for pre-seed, we usually look at traction, LOIs, your current team and your advisors. And then for a seed stage is mostly uh, a lot of a lot of what pre-seed was, but also looking at like kind of the prestigious points. What acceleration have you gotten into? Um, at the same time, have you raised capital from a significant VC um, or a micro VC? And then from there, their network as well. So it's like looking at any kind of PR that you've done previously, making sure that we're able to uh, tap back into any uh, PR PR articles or anything that has like shown showcase your company before in order to kind of build up the momentum when you do launch once again. That's awesome. Great. Um, we got a couple more questions around um, what is a lead investor? What is the difference between a lead and a follow on investor? What are the risks perhaps associated with both of those roles and um, how to think about it both from a founder perspective, but also from a potential investor perspective too? So a lead investor is usually an investor that puts together the term sheet. So let's say if you're doing one funding round, so you're raising half a million dollars, $1 million from multiple investors, usually the terms would be the same terms. It wouldn't be, oh, you're negotiating separately with 10 different people, but the terms has to be pretty industry standard as in, or let's say it's a convertible note or safe note. What's the valuation cap? What's the discount? And uh, what are, are they, any rights, investor rights, board observer, board seats. But other than that, a legal document may have five pages, 10 pages, but usually it's pretty standard. So you wouldn't try to go and negotiate certain things that, that are, are pretty boilerplate. So having a lead that understands the process then helps makes the process go a lot more smooth. And then other investors who may be less experienced or their model, they, they might be investing in a bunch of deals, but they, they don't want to be leading deals, then they, they'll, they'll be following on. And usually the lead is also gonna be the point of contact. 
So that with that, and then they, they may be connecting with, with other investors, or sometimes if there's a board seat or a board observer seat, then the lead usually will be the person that represents those investor group as, as taking a board seat. The lead typically takes a larger position in the round, but it doesn't have to be that, oh, they're the largest. Sometimes there's a, investors that may have a larger check size, they may have a large position, but they say they, they don't want to lead the round because the, of the administrative work or they're positive. Like, we don't want to take a board seat, but another investors might be a slightly smaller check might be taking that board or board observer seat or want to be more hands-on. Along the answer to Liam's question here, he was asking about stay plugged in the, in the deal flow, tag along with the lead. Uh, I wouldn't say lead the deal yet, uh, but tag along with the lead investor, ask all the questions, plug in on all the meetings and um, learn their process and see the questions we ask and all the documents in request. So uh, in regards to WeFunder, in terms of uh, a lead, a lead doesn't have to be the individual that's investing the most. However, they have to be investing a minimum of $1,000. Uh, most of the time, individuals who are usually leading this are either principals at micro VCs or angels or someone that you really trust. So, because again, the lead is going to be there for long term, uh, going to be an advising you know, on a daily, like not a daily basis, hopefully, uh, <laughs> maybe on a quarterly basis or monthly basis. You want to make sure that they agree upon your vision associated with the company. And so, most of the time with WeFunder, it's usually not the person writing the largest check, but just a, a minimum of $1,000 because you want that person to basically one, think of uh, think of the company first, and then from there, make sure that, you know, they're not trying to position your company in a way that you don't want it to, right? So making sure that you guys both have the same vision in mind when you first, when you're asking them to be in that position, because at the end of the day, they also receive the pro rata rights associated with the round. And so even if they're investing a minimum of a thousand dollars, and if they're your lead and you raise 300,000, they have the pro rata rights associated with the 300,000. So they can go ahead and spin out an SBV on your next round to keep that position associated with your rights, even though they only invested a thousand. So you want to make sure that this person is someone you will see long term associated with your your current company, and at the end of the day, uh, it's going to be able to advise you uh, follow in any in any capacity following the refund round. Thank you. Um, and hopefully that clarified some of the questions around lead investors and what their role is in all of this. And um, for 49SF, for example, we are follow on investments only. So we won't lead the rounds. Um, the staff is myself and I have Matthew Robinson, who's also on this call, helping me out. Uh, we're a very lean staff, but we certainly want to be making as many deals as possible. We just don't have the staff and resources to negotiate the deals uh, first and foremost. There was an, also another question from an investor perspective from Jake um, saying the news seems to be indicating that capital is flowing like never before, which is very true. Um, my question is this, how can you be competitive as an investor and still get the returns you need when you're competing with entities that seem to prioritize massive quantity over quality. I could jump in on this <laughs> on our end, right? Um, so one of the biggest things we're currently currently like uh, establishing for the next quarter is sidecar funds associated with a lot, some of the major companies, right? So major investment firms. Most investment firms are able to go ahead and throw larger amounts of money. And that's, that's something that they're able to do uh, just due to the fact that they've had a lot of exits previously. Uh, and so the fact that they're putting these large check sizes, um, they usually have something called a sidecar fund where individuals who are from like, either family offices or just accredited investors are able to invest alongside them. We want to do that for unaccredited investors. And so now we're working with uh, BC firms as well as angel syndicates and saying, hey, look, you can have a unaccredited or Reg CF unaccredited version of a sidecar fund where you're allowing the community who has been following your deal flow for years and years and years uh, to basically invest alongside. So any single time you throw in a check, uh, basically these, and you, these, you, they can uh, follow on in terms of unaccredited individuals putting in $100, but the uh, organization can go ahead and lead that round and have the pro rata rights associated with their community portion, the cycle fund. So uh, this is just a way for unaccredited investors to invest in the same deals that 
uh, these large organizations are actually taking up, but actually benefit based upon the fact that they don't have to do the hard work associated with getting those companies to the next level, right? So you're basically uh, utilizing the larger VC firms to do all the hard work while you benefit on the back end by just relax, hopefully. Yes, uh, for us, it's about quality over quantity. So we want to find the right founders, the right company, and also at a reasonable valuation as well. So if there's if we're competing deal with other different VC firms, we're not going to win because we're giving you the highest valuation, we're giving you the most money. But if we're going to win, it's because uh, we're gonna we can convince the founders that we're going to be adding most value that that we're the best partners for you in the long term standpoint. So we. We will give term sheets that's competitive, that, that, but, but we're not going to over bid just because that's the market conditions. And for the founders as well, that, that you want to look at that, that is it the most important that you get the strongest term sheet or the strongest partnership? Somebody who has your back as, as an investor, that, that your incentives are, are aligned as an investor with the, the founders in a longer term perspective. I think uh, one thing that is important for us at the Alaska Angel Conference uh, is that is a beneficial uh, agreement for both the investors and the uh, and the companies. So, um, make, giving it back to the Alaska economy and also making the terms uh, important acceptable for the investors. It's a relationship that has to be mutual beneficial. We we want. Uh, is make a deal that will disincentivize the, the founders to work on their company. So we need to, them, we always uh, look to give those um, terms that will keep the, the founders engaged and um, have the ownership on their company. Thank you. And uh, there are, well, I think a lot of us have watched Shark Tank on TV and oftentimes we think about those investors um, that are so, gosh, cutthroat um, and asking for outsized portions of the company to some extent, um, but that's not the case for every investor. And uh, oftentimes you're thinking, well, I really need that money, so I'll take any terms, but there is certainly a big piece of startup founders need to be um, also cognizant of what they're getting themselves into and have that proper understanding. Um, and if that's a place that you're currently in, there is a legal basics uh, event happening tomorrow by attorneys uh, from Dorsey and Whitney uh, as part of Startup Week. So I'd encourage you to attend that and ask all those questions for free uh, from those attorneys. Let's see, we had a question around what metrics do you look for as investors to help either with the long-term growth of um, the company? Um, is it customer lifetime value that you're specifically looking for? What should this group of startups be thinking about in terms of quantitative measures? So I think there's multiple measures out there. There's a revenue, but it's also what's the quality of the revenue? What's the margins? What's the customer acquisition cost? Are you paying to acquire revenue that, that's uh, going to be value added for, for your company in the long term? Or, or are you doing it to grow a user base, which some companies do that the early on the economies of scale may not be there, but you have to be able to prove that at some point, it's going to be a sustainable, profitable business, and you have to show the milestones that that because let's say a seed investor will will look at what an A investor will look at. How can we help this company get to the Series A? The, the A investor will look how we get the company to the the Series B. So they'll look at all the, these metrics, and then the growth metrics. Is it going to grow fast enough to be a venture back business? Then then uh, will be attracted to VC funds. Or is it a small business, which is fine too. The, the investor may just be a different type of investor. It, it might be a more stable business or they may have certain assets that that's going to back those businesses. So when we look at funding, it doesn't all, only have to be the high growth, ultra high growth venture capital. It's finding the right investors that meet with the type of business and the metrics that 
your business is able to deliver, but they'll look at comparables, look at peers. All right, let's say if you're opening a coffee shop, what do coffee shops look at for metrics? Like what's the cost? What's revenue per customer? How often are repeat customers, the, 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 the traffic? So there's uh, each industry will have those different metrics, but they will compare with the industry. Or if you're opening up a new segment of the market, then, then they'll look at, all right, so how is this differentiated from what was before? And it could be something that, that's really attractive, but you have to convince them with the numbers that uh, this is where you're at now. And at a steady state where you project it to be one year, two years, three years from now, it's going to be something that that's going to be very attractive. Thank you. And I'll also answer uh, Oki's question um in the uh, chat about um, additional metrics and portfolio investments that are much more impact inclined um, there's a movement and a commitment about due diligence 2.0 that i've been keeping an eye on uh, that looks at triple bottom line metrics and analytics uh, from an investor's standpoint and i'll add the link in the chat um, but that's been something that's then interesting to see how do you incorporate ESG metrics into um, your investments, both as a startup and as a funder. Um, and ESG, ESG standing for environmental, social, and governance metrics. Let's see, I think uh, there was a question from Magpie, which I'm not sure if that's your first name or your business's name um, about investors investing in companies that are much more community spaces. So theaters, cafes, events, production spaces, um, and they're dialing in from Valdez, Alaska. Um, I think the answer is yes. Uh, Ricky uh, answered that a little bit of, well, there are all types of investors out there and they might all be looking for different deal types and types of returns too. Um, and it's just finding that, making that matchmaking between the investor and the founder uh, to make sure that it is mutually beneficial in the long run and that we stay away from Shark Tank type investments. Yes. And a little add to that as well, that even if you're doing a location-based business, Sometimes you start with the first location and if you find a model that, that's scalable, then it could also replicate to other cities, other locations as well. But you have to start with the first one and decide what part of the business cycle you want to be, whether you want to own the property or you want to manage the property or you do, you're creating a software that's going to help manage the property because some, some other parts of it could be a very scalable business on top of something that's very traditional. Did you want to add anything, Magpie, uh, around this? <laughs> no, it's just good to hear that because in um, the startup week so far, I've just heard a lot of tech conversation and I'm kind of the only one involved in the arts and community-based event stuff. So, um, but yeah, I, I have heard that scalable comment. So thank you for um, adding to that. So you're, you're right. We do need a few platforms designed. <laughs> Thank you. And I would say there are a lot of open houses by more traditional businesses that are happening this week, too. Um, I know Kodiak is live streaming from the Kodiak Brewing and Still um, facilities, which will be really neat. There are some CPG companies, uh, consumer packaged good companies. There, in Anchorage, there's Blue Market Alaska uh, that is going to do an open house as well. Um, so, so there are a lot of cool things. I know we tend to be very tech focused because that's where the big bucks can often come from, but um, there are some great more brick and mortar type businesses that are absolutely worth investing in. There was a question from Andre about um, federal grants applications um, and how do you treat matching funds? Um, and I'll take a first step of answering that. Um, in the case of 49th Angel Fund, we will match grant, well, we can't match 
public uh, grants. Um, so if you had a private grant from a foundation or other entity, we could match it. However, we do, do look to the founder to present us with a term sheet um, and do the research around legally and accounting wise, what are the implications of having both grants and equity investments in your company. How do the three of our panelists view grants as part of your investment process? So I think grants can also help in the earlier stages because grant is non-dilutive funding. So it's better than raising capital that uh, you either have to pay back if it's uh, a convertible note or a loan, or if it's equity, then they'll own a part of the company. So there are grants, a lot of programs out there. And, and if, even for us, we're looking in, into to it as well, that if it's something that's going to help jumpstart you at the early stages, and if it's a good fit, then, then be all means go for it. It usually requires some specialization because uh, the, the grant is usually pretty uh, industry project or type specific. There's some that's a little more generalized, like, like uh, uh, SBIR or some, something that that's for or from R&D type. And then it, it usually goes in, in uh, uh, phases. And, and once you show certain milestones, you can continue on, on, on those phases. But there's also a lot of local state local type grants that I'm not too familiar about, but but there, there, there is a lot of them out there and you want to see that that if it's pretty low hanging fruit that, that you can get, usually the dollar amount is not huge, but if it's something that as a, from a, a smaller company, then it's, it still helps that, that you want to be diligent with your capital if it's something that, that can help you early on. And sometimes it also builds credibility. It's not only the dollar amount, but it builds credibility that, hey, we got this grant, we got vetted by these uh, agencies and, and with that, then it may open more doors to, to customers or other funding later down the road. Yeah, I'm just gonna second everything Ricky just said. <laughs> Terrific, thank you. Brad. Hey there, I'm curious if uh, you all can touch on notions of ownership, at least where it touches VC. Um, uh, we're in the process of structuring our bylaws around a steward ownership model, and um, that is going to likely preclude any kind of traditional exit. And I just wonder if that also takes traditional VC off the table. Thanks. Who wants to tackle that? And I'll take a stab at it. So depends on the bylaws, we have to read it. Usually, so a business attorney that is familiar with, with startups usually set up a company in a certain way that's uh, most uh, attractive as in it's, it's standard and the, whether an angel investor or a VC will look at it, and that's the structure that that's going to be able to grow with the company. The management's may team may change. The founders may have tighter control at the beginning, but it's a governance structure. As the company grows, then it's governed by a board of directors, good governance, and as new investors come in, they may be able to nominate somebody on the board and help with the governance at, at, at that standpoint. And at, at some point, then either the company gets acquired or becomes public, and the board and the shareholders will have a role on, on that. Now, if, if you write in a certain way where an exit may be prohibitive, then as an investor, you look at it. So if we don't exit to get returns there, then it'll be returns from, from dividends, from shareholders, uh, the type benefits, which is possible, but then you have to look at from an economic standpoint, is it something that, that uh, will give returns that's attractive and, for most investors, they may not have the flexibility to do that because the, there's other deals out there that they're also comparing with. So the more restrictions you put in there, then you have to compensate with either more, much more favorable terms. So instead of there, they want 5% of the company, I, I want 25% of the company because I, I need more control because I won't be able to sell or there's certain things that will compensate. So at the end of the day, you have to decide, is it worth it from having that level of extra restrictions there, or is there other ways of governance that you can still have good governance and investor wouldn't feel too restrictive while 
you can still get to to push your your vision, get to push your mandate to a much later stage with with the right team of directors, right governance team that's going to help you push it to that. And and uh, it's not only about the the type of control, but it's about can you bring in vision because you can't grow a company alone. How how do you bring in the right people that share that vision and, and try to bring it as far as you can? Thank you. Great. What great questions coming from everyone. Um, with three minutes left in this event, and I know that there's, gosh, another funding-related event that is about to start um, as part of Alaska Startup Week. There's another one around growing entrepreneurship during the pandemic and a LinkedIn marketing event that are happening in three minutes. So there is a jammed pack schedule. I don't know which one you'll all select to go to, um, but I want to give a big round of applause, virtual applause for our panelists for asking, for answering all the great questions and for all of you who asked those questions and attended um, and had took the time out of your day to participate here because gosh, this was a great conversation. Um, Addy, Anna, and Ricky, if you would kindly add any follow-up links or contact information in the chat for folks to reach out to you, however you'd like to be contacted, that would be lovely. Gordon, you read my mind. Um, and I'll drop in a link if you enjoyed this session. We have, or actually hated it, we have a feedback survey to tell us how we did. Um, that I would love for all of you to fill out and give us that feedback so that we can keep having great events as part of Startup Week. Um, and there will be a giveaway uh, for one random submission uh, for a, as part of that feedback form. So I encourage all of you to do it, at least for fun, to see what you might be able to win um, and to make sure that we keep having some great programs. Um, and with that, uh, thank you all for attending today. I am copying and pasting and putting links in the chat if you want to hang on and take them down. Um, and feel free to reach out to me as well at any point in time if uh, you, if I can be of any help. Thank you all and happy startup week.